that woman, if that woman hadn't gotten a hold of you. All right, y'all can see. Y'all can have a seat. <laughs> Amen. I, 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 the Lord led me to, to title the message the parenthood, parenthood, the greatest assignment from God, God's greatest assignment. However, we are going to be discussing and focusing on the aspect of motherhood today because today is Mother's Day. Celebrated in probably every church, Christian church, and even in secular areas, Mother's Day is being celebrated. Sermons are being preached, addressing the responsibility and blessing of being a parent, specifically of that of being a mother. Amen? Now, I was praying about this message, and as I was trying to ask the Lord, where do you want me to be today in your word? And this scripture just kept coming to mind. It just kept coming to mind. And it's very difficult for me to preach a sermon on righteous motherhood, a sermon that speaks to the power and the influence of a godly woman and the power she has over her family, her friends, her acquaintances, a sermon that speaks to the strength of character and blessing that these type of women embody and encourage without at some point having to mention this scripture. Because the scripture doesn't say train up your child. It doesn't say the children that were born to you, the children of your body, make sure you train them up. It doesn't say that. It says train up a child. Because we have women here who have never birthed a child, but they are mothers. Oh, yes, they are. Oh, yes, they are. Because the biblical requirement of parenthood is the training up of a child. Not whether you can have a child. And as good, as wonderful as that is, and we must honor that. Amen? But the biblical requirement of parenthood is the training up of a child. A whole lot of people have children. They don't know what to do with them. They don't know how to train them. Amen. Never seen some of their children. Don't know some of their children. Never met them. Oh, yes. Got rid of them. Even before they were born. Amen. So if parenthood is having a child, well, then that argument can't fly. No, parenthood is training a child. Training a child. And we understand that this is the responsibility of both parents. But there's something very unique and individual that mothers bring to this process, and that's what we want to talk about today. You know, in 2013, the magazine Psychology Today, it conducted a study on the unique aspects of motherhood. Now, in this article, the study revealed what they considered to be some of the most important and unique aspects of motherhood. Now, now, please understand that I don't rely on secular publications and studies to verify the ultimate truths of the Bible. I don't do that. But I thought it was very interesting how this aspect of training 
figured so prominently in the world's understanding of what is necessary to be a good mother. Even the world says you got to train your children. I've always heard that when it comes to training, training is not something, amen, where you get to collaborate. Ask if it's okay if you do this or that. Training is literally dictation. Amen. The subject being trained does not have a say in the matter. You know, that's one of the biggest problems with children today. (laughs) We let them tell us how they want to be trained. Is that okay with you? Do you like this? Is that going to be okay? Oh, help me, Jesus. Oh, yeah. There's some folk get angry, man, when you talk like this. That's right. Children ought to be able to tell you what they want and be able to say what they like. Oh, really? And I do agree, yes, of course. Amen. We have to encourage, amen, and make sure that we bring children up, amen, and uh, encourage their intelligence and their inquisitiveness and you know, their, their quest for knowledge and their, 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 their willingness, amen, to, uh, uh, you know, to inquire about things and, amen, their curiosities and so forth. But you better understand, you still have a responsibility to train. They said a few things about mothers I want to read this morning very quickly. They said mothers are the bearers of life. These are some of the things that this study found were unique and interesting and important when it comes to the aspect, this aspect of parenthood, motherhood. It says, mothers are the bearers of life, and if it weren't for your mother, wouldn't be breathing right now. Wouldn't be here. Mothers are the emotional backbone of the family. They provide the hiding place, and the holding place for everyone's feelings. Protecting and guarding the emotional health of the family to help keep us from being hurt. Mothers have a magic touch, magic kiss, to help heal our wounds, physical and emotional. Mothers have to sacrifice their bodies and sometimes their very lives to bring life into this world. And then there are often further sacrifices of education, careers, earnings, and future security that mothers willingly make to ensure the development and success of her children and her family. Mothers are forgiving. In fact, psychologists found that find that children usually learn forgiveness from their mothers. Mothers will support your dreams when no one else will. While the father usually enforces the boundaries, it is usually the mother who defines the boundaries. As a parent, mothers understand that it is the boundaries that shape the personality and make you a better person. You may not have liked some of her decisions, especially when you wanted to have your way. But her decisions kept you out of trouble. 
Just look at some of your friends today whose mothers did not care to define boundaries for them. A mother's ears and eyes hear and see everything. They also have a computer-like memory for all the good and the bad that has come your way. As an adult, and this is what I miss most about my mother, if there's anything I miss, it's this I miss this about my mother most. We would sit in her room and we would talk. And that woman, it's, it's, you know, it's something to talk to somebody that knows everything about you. See, I can talk to a lot of folks. You don't know everything about me. It's something to be able to talk to somebody that knows everything about you. The ability to reminisce about your whole life with your mother is one of life's greatest joys. If you still have your mother, you just spend some time and let her tell you about yourself. All the dumb things you did, all the stupid things you did, all the good things you did, all the things you didn't know she knows you did. Mothers teach their children to be a functioning adult. While mothers and fathers both teach their children hard skills. How? Hard skills. How to do something. How to perform a task. It is usually the mother who teaches the soft skills. Not just doing something, but why you must do something. When you must do something. Social cues. Subtlety. Manners. Politeness. Amen. You see, we thank our mothers for teaching us those things. We get, our, we get angry at our wives when they enforce them. Did you wash your hands? Girl, I'm a grown man. Did you wash your hands? See, your mother taught you to wash your hands, but now it's your wife's job to enforce. Don't get angry at her. Didn't get angry at mommy. Amen. And you didn't wash your hands. Go wash them. You didn't wash them. A whole lot of men going to go, just gonna, just lie. Just, yeah, I washed them. <laughs> They'd be looking at them ashy hands. And no, I don't, them, them, hand, them hands don't look like, ain't no water, no lotion, nothing on them hands. Amen. See, without these skills, making it through the modern world would be very hard. Your mother may have forced you to do things you did not want to do, but now we can see just how important it was. Now, that's the world. That's psychology today. Amen? And they're not so far off, are they? No, because the aspect of training is a biblical requirement. It is something that is unavoidable, amen, and the, the, the parent that learns how to train their children, amen, are the ones that are going to be able to rest most easy at night. Because it doesn't matter if your children don't want to do everything that they've been trained to do, but as long as you know you trained them, amen. See, because of godly training, this is what the Apostle Paul could say about young Timothy. If you remember, he was a man that he could trust and rely on. Although Timothy's father may have been a great man, the Bible says he was a Greek in Acts chapter 16 and verse 1. And so because he was a Greek, there was no indication that he was a follower of Jesus Christ. But it was the women in Timothy's life, his grandmother and his mother, that instructed Timothy in the faith and encouraged his relationship with Jesus Christ. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul says, I call to remembrance 
the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice. And I'm persuaded that in thee as well. It's in you too. I know, I know those are godly women, and I know that they trained you too. See, Paul had adopted Timothy. We know the story. Paul had adopted Timothy as his spiritual son in the ministry, and Paul recognized Timothy as a man of excellence, a man of character, a man of faith. Timothy proved to be faithful in every way. The scriptures indicate that Timothy was trained to have sincere faith in God from a very early age. And Paul always exhorted Timothy to never forget the things he had learned from his mother and his grandmother. In the third chapter of 2 Timothy and verse 14, Paul says it this way. He, in speaking to Tim Timothy, he says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Not only are you to continue in what you have learned, Timothy, don't forget who taught them to you. You are the man you are today because of those two women. Never forget that. Never forget that. You've been made a steward. You've been given a gift that some people don't get. That's the thing we have to recognize, and it's hard to see it when we were children. But don't you thank the Lord for a mother, amen, praise God, who was able to give you a gift, not only the gift of life, but the gift of how to live life. To navigate life. To understand life. That life is not always easy. There's ups and there's downs. And I know some of you may not have known your mothers. Your actual physical mothers. Birth mothers. But that, I'm not going to say it doesn't matter. But I will say this. That's not the priority here. Amen. The priority is who trains you. Who trained you? Somebody had to train you. Amen. And we thank God. Paul says, I can trust Timothy. Why? Because I know who trained him. I know who trained him. When we look at three today, we're going to look at three very important qualities of how Timothy was trained up in the faith by his grandmother and his mother. One of the finest men I know is my brother-in-law, Harvey Richardson. Call him Benjamin. One of the finest men I know. And he lost his mother at a very, very young age. But Miss Gloria Robinson, my mother-in-law, Sister Sabrina's mother, took him in and raised him Somebody had to train you. Are y'all listening to me? Somebody had to train you. So this is why today we honor the training. Praise God. Because that's what makes us who we are. There are three qualities I want to talk about today. Discipline. Dedication. And determination. The word tells us that our children must be taught these qualities in order that they may be trained up in the way that they should. Somebody say should. They should go. They can go a whole lot of ways, but there's only one way they're supposed to go. There should they should go. There's only one way they should go. And so first we deal with discipline. Train up a child. It says in verse 6 of Proverbs 22, in the way he should go. In the way he should go. Timothy had what Paul refers to as an unfeigned faith to work to the work of God. This means he had a sincere and a genuine faith. 
Developing this type of faith takes discipline. This type of faith has to be diligently taught. Diligently taught. It's very important that we understand today that having an unfeigned faith means something. It's important. God requires it. Discipline, see, requires that we go a particular way, not the way we want to go. Discipline, I'll say it again, requires that we go a particular way, not the way we want to go. The world says go wherever you want to go. Do whatever you want to do. In fact, that's the mantra of this generation, isn't it? We do what we want to do. Right? We do what we want to do. Nobody tells us anything. We do what we want to do. Right? Well, that is a foolish assertion. It's a foolish assertion. The Bible says you have to be trained to go in a way you should go. There is a way to do it. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man. Amen? But the end thereof are the ways of death. I thank God for a mother that taught me the right way. Oh, my gosh. That taught me the right way. Didn't let me go the wrong way just because I wanted to go that way. Think about how many people are preaching faith today. That's a big thing, right? Faith everywhere. Faith, 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 faith. Got to have faith, right? But faith in what? Faith in whom? What kind of faith are they preaching? Is it a faith to get whatever I want? Because that's usually what they say. Get faith and then get stuff. Get faith, get stuff. Get faith, get car, get faith, get house, get faith. Get job, get faith, get money. Right? I mean, if I'm missing something, tell me, but that's what I'm hearing. Right? But that's not what the Bible says. No, that's not what faith is for. (laughs) Amen? Faith is so we can what? Trust God. Know that God is God, that he's real, and that he shall supply all our need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Amen, that if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything we need shall be added. It's our faith, amen, to trust in he who we have never seen. Amen, and know that he knows us, loves us, and is with us. You see, for many people, faith is simply a tool, set of tools Extra, where uh, uh, to be exercised as a means of getting something from God, extracting some blessing from heaven. These people believe they can use faith to manipulate a blessing out of the hand of God. However, disciplined faith is a belief system that establishes our belief, our understanding, and our relationship with God. Once that relationship has been established, then everything Necessary for that relationship is supplied by the hand of God himself. To think any other way, to think any other way, puts my faith in people and things and not in God. You see, undisciplined people never finish the course. They never finish. Their faithfulness is always uh, tied to their, 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 their comfort or their so-called success. So their faithfulness always wanes because it is based only on material achievement. If they're not getting something material, they believe they'll just leave it alone. This can't be for me. If any difficulty arises, well, I'll leave it alone. This can't be for me. They've never been trained to stay there. Oh, anybody here? Oh, glory to God. At the first sense of danger, first, first moment of difficulty, they turn their tail, tuck their tail, and run. But somebody that's been trained, glory to God, stays in place. They begin well, but they never finish well. They are unreliable. These people are unreliable unless they are immediately rewarded. You know people like that? Unreliable unless they're immediately rewarded. 
If they don't get the reward they believe they deserve, they quit. When it comes to ministry, and when it came to ministry, the Apostle Paul, he was all in. Ah, I heard that this morning. Oh, that was good. He was all in. He not only took ministry seriously, he took it personally. In the 20th chapter of Acts, in the 24th verse, Paul says, but none of these things move me, neither count I life dear unto myself, so that I might finish the course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. The second thing I want to talk to you about today is dedication. You must be trained in discipline, but you must also be trained in dedication. Train up a child in the way they should go, and when he is old, when he is old. See, Paul tells Timothy that this unfeigned faith first dwelt in his grandmother and later in his mother. This indicates that these women loved the word of God and taught Timothy to do so also. Faith cometh by hearing, correct? Romans 10 and 7, and 17, excuse me. And so, so he heard from these two women, and he grew in faith. However, it also tells us that the older taught the younger. And I'm sure Timothy was not always a good student, but his grandmother and his mother made, somebody say made, made him learn the word of God. <laughs> These days, oh no, if you don't want to do it, don't force them. That might not be where he's going. He, he has another way of doing things. Oh, praise God. Or a mother that, oh my gosh, that could steer you in the right path. And a father that could keep you there. But anyway, you got another one. That's enough. Amen. You see, remember that faith is something that must not only be critically apparent in the life. Without faith, it's impossible to please him, right? That's Hebrews 11 and 6. It must be critically apparent. People must see it. But it also must be consistently applied. Critically apparent and consistently applied in the life. The quality and dedication to God and his word is not something that we begin, then we put aside when it becomes inconvenient for our lives. No, it is the very essence of our lives. And it actually brings us the gift of grace. And of old age. You, 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 the world has very little regard for old age. Have you noticed that? But my Bible says here, when he is old. So that the word says, good training will help you get there. Anybody here? See, I want to get old. That's right. Because the Bible tells me it's a blessing. Okay? They have very little regard for old age. Paint a very negative picture of old age. The Bible, however, honors old age above youth. <laughs> it doesn't honor youth. Think about it. Youth is just a natural process of everything that's alive. Youth is a natural process of all that are living. Every living creature experiences youth. Every living creature experiences youth. However, old age. Is not promised to everybody. Old age is a gift. I know there may be some creaking hinges and some, you know, you know, some some other parts of the house that might be hurting a little bit. But you know, old age is a gift. <laughs> Youth. <laughs> okay, you're young. Good. There you go. Good for you. Guess what? Everybody experiences youth. Everybody. If you're alive for a month or for 20 years, you experience youth. 
Everybody's young. You have to start that way. But not everybody gets to grow old. Mm. And my Bible says when he is old. So there's something that there's something about that that God says is important. Amen. That's why in Psalm 91 and 16 it says, with long life I will satisfy him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. You know, it's very interesting how the world calls old age bad, but the Bible calls it a good thing. The Bible says of Abraham in Genesis 25 and 8, Gideon in Judges 8 and 32, and David in 1 Chronicles 29 and 28. He says they all died in a good old age. Not of a good old age, in a good old age. That means, man, they were old and enjoying life and, you know, then it's time for them to go on home. That's right. We must stay dedicated to God's word because the scriptures promise that the latter shall be more powerful and prosperous than the former. Man, I wouldn't want to be 20 again if you gave me a million dollars. I will tell you that right now. All that stuff that these people put on these old crazy movies and stuff about getting young and all, keep it. My Lord. Man, I'm so glad I ain't 20 no more. <laughs> Ooh. My gosh. Amen. Thank God for a little time. Amen. The latter is what? Better than the former. It says so in Psalm 92 and verse 14. Psalm 94, 2 and verse 14 says, they shall bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Yes. Prosperous, powerful, healthy. Amen. We thank God for that. Amen. Lastly today, the next aspect of training that we need to discuss is determination determination not only was there discipline not only was there discipline not only was there dedication but there must also be a determination to do it God's way your training must include determination in other words my, as my father used to used to used to say and my mother used to say they use this word they would say stick to itiveness I don't you won't find that in the dictionary but they'd always say, you don't have enough stick to it of this. Oh, it's like they both seem to know that. You got to stick with it. And there's nobody like a mother that will just tell you, stick with it. Stay there. It'll be all right. But you don't know. So just stay there. Stick with it. God has a way we must follow if we want to obtain his promises. You see, in in, in Proverbs 22 and 6, the last part of that verse says that when he's old, he will not depart. He will not depart from it. He'll stick to it. He'll stick to his training. He'll stick to his training. Paul was convinced that the example that he saw in Timothy's grandmother and mother were also in him. In his epistle to the Philippians, Paul refers to this quality as like-mindedness. Another word for like-mindedness is consistency. In writing to the church at Philippi, Paul told them without equivocation that there was only one man whom he believed would be faithful to carry out all of the assignments he gave faithfully, and that man was Timothy. In fact, he says in Philippians 2 and 20, he says, I have no man like-minded, no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. You see the key verse here, the key to that scripture is, are the words, who will naturally care for your state. Look at that, naturally care for your state, naturally care for your state. He has been trained so well to do the right thing, now it's a part of him. He does it without thinking. You know, when our children were still at home and driving, they, their cars would be parked right outside the garage. And... Whenever we would leave, getting out of there, especially trying to get out there in the morning, whatever, slam that thing into reverse and start taking off. And But I always have to remember, there's a car back there. Cars are back there. Don't be careful, right? Their cars haven't been there for years. 
But every time I get ready to come out that garage, I'm always thinking, that car. I always think that, my, that car might be back there. Right? Why? Because of the years of training, of having to do it a particular way, it just hasn't gone away. I still think there's a car back there. Okay, let me tell you something. When you train a child, the Bible says that when they are old, they will not depart. It will become a natural part of who they are. So either you're going to get good training or bad training, and some folk, they ain't been trained too well or too good. They haven't. What they naturally do is always wrong. How they naturally speak is always ugly and rude. How they naturally handle a situation is always just, just, just bad. And you're like, and they don't see it. Because that's, that, that's what they naturally do. But thank God for those who have been taught righteousness. Amen? Paul says, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care. That's who he is. This is who Timothy is. Timothy is not some, he's not putting on a show for you. He's not making it up. He's not different. He's not, you're not going to see a different Timothy tomorrow than you're going to see him today. He's not going to be different here and better here or different over here and changed over here. This is who the man is, and he will naturally care for your state. You see, Paul knew that Timothy had been well-trained as a child by two godly women. His grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. And because of this training, he knew that Timothy would not depart. He wouldn't leave. You know, as I was preparing this message, I came upon a story. I think I've told you before. But like Elder Hayward says, if you heard it, act like you've never heard it. It's my story, so I'm going to tell it. Right, Elder? It's my story. I'm telling it. If you ain't heard it, well, if you've heard it, well, act like you just heard it. But, but <laughs> once you've been trained by a godly mother, amen, there's just some things you ain't going to do. You're just not going to do. Some places you ain't going to go. And you know what? Isn't it interesting that, you, I mean, even if you try to go there, you just feel out of place. If you try to act that way, it just don't work. If you try to speak that way, it just don't quite, you know, folks look at you like, Boy, you don't even talk like that. Stop. And they don't have to know you. They just know you don't even talk that way. Stop. Right? That's not how you've been trained. There's this little boy. He was riding his bicycle around the block, riding around the block. And, you know, he went round the block and round the block and round the block, you know, just pedaling with all his might, you know. And uh, a policeman, you know, was passing by, and he saw the child come around the block. And, you know, he watched the child disappear. And a few minutes later, he saw the child reappear again, and he watched this for a little while. The child was just going round and round and round the block. So he went, you know, he, so he, he, he went up to the child because he was a little concerned. While the child is pedaling, the child is just crying, crying. He's weeping, just uh, bawling and crying and pedaling and riding. So that gave him a little concern. So he went up to the little boy and he said, hey, whoa, whoa stop, 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 stop. He said, are you okay? Is everything all right? He says, no, I'm running away from home. <laughs> so the policeman, you know, looked at him a little bit and said, um, well, you know, if you're running away from home, I've been standing here for a few minutes, and all I see is you going round and round and round the block. You haven't even crossed the street. The little boy looked at him and said, yeah, I haven't crossed the street. I can't. He says, why? Because my mama told me I can't cross the street. <laughs> can you see that, mother? I'm running away from her. All right, go ahead, but don't, leave, don't cross the street. Go. Bye. <laughs> you see? Mothers, what blessings. Amen? What an honor it is for us to honor you today, to thank God for you. To let you know how much we love you. To let you, let you know that we thank you for the training. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your willingness to give of yourself. That there is no calling as high as the willingness to train a child. It takes love. It takes commitment, 
It takes patience. But above everything else, it takes discipline. It takes dedication. It takes you doing the right things. Seeking God's help through all of it. We want you to know today that we honor you. We love you. We thank God for you. And we look forward to being a part of days like this. Many years in the future. For those of us, men that are here, young people that are here, stand at this time, if you will. And for all these mothers here today, all these women of God here today, let's thank the Lord for them. Amen? Shall we? Let us all stand, please. Father, we just come right now into your presence. We thank you for the blessing of motherhood. We thank you for the privilege of being able to have women who love you, women who are worthy of honor, women who are worthy of of our time, our effort, the best that we have. We ask right now, dear Lord, you continue to encourage and strengthen them, continue to bless and keep them, continue to show them your goodness and your mercy. For, Father, for all that are here today, we thank you for the privilege of worship and the time we've spent in your presence. And Lord, we're just thankful. We're grateful. What an honor. We just ask, dear Father, that you allow the word we've heard today to dwell richly in our hearts. Strengthening us, blessing us, and keeping us. We ask it all, of course, in Jesus' name. With your head still bowed and your eyes still closed, I just want to offer to anyone here this morning the relationship of salvation through Jesus Christ. If you are unsaved, if you don't know him, today is the day of salvation. Harden not your hearts. Is there someone today? Is there an individual here? Is there someone today? Praise the Lord. Father, we give you honor and praise today. We love you and glorify you. We thank you and ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen.